Good afternoon and welcome to Sustainable Fleet Technology Webinar Series, Best Practices of the Top Fleet Award Winners for 2023. Before we begin, I would like to go over some housekeeping details with a reminder that this session is being recorded and that registrants for this course will have access to the recording later this afternoon. For those of you not already familiar with Zoom, please note that there is a Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. When you click on it, a box will open. If you have a question or would like to make a comment, please type it there. At this point, I would like to turn things over to Rick Sapienza. Speakers, you can turn on your cameras and your mics. There we go. Okay, now I'm, I'm, uh, I got the show, so here we go. Uh, as Annette said, I'd like to welcome everybody, and this is the Sustainable Fleet Technology Webinar Series. This is session seven. Uh, we got a handful more coming the rest of the year. And this is best practices of the top, top Green Fleet Award winners of 2023. Um, do want to thank our sponsors for this series, and here they are. <clears throat> in fact, one of them is going to speak today. Um, some really good products, so I want to, you know, introduce folks to these if you're not already using them, and you know maybe they can help you out. Um, there's a good group here. We we'll get to hear from um, Pioneer Mobility about their eBoost system um, a little bit later. Also, want to thank our sponsors for the Green Fleet Awards contest. Uh, a couple repeats um, that are supporting the webinar series as a whole, as well as this contest. Um, upcoming webinar, webinars uh, in two weeks, alternative fuel total cost of ownership case studies. We'll look at a couple different alternative fuels and specific case studies, and then some. Some we'll introduce some of the tools out there to maybe help you out a little bit and get you in the ballpark. Uh, charging resiliency and off-grid solutions on October 11th, and then I'll, I'll announce the last three to finish out the year uh, between now and probably October 11th. Uh, format, save your Q&A to the end. Um, we've been putting them in the chat, the chat or questions. I guess let's go with questions today, so they're all in one spot. Uh, we're scheduled to 2, two to 3.15. Uh, there's a handout and recording. They'll all be sent to everybody that registered, so you'll get a copy of these slides. Um, you know, as I said, you know, we're going to run through December on this. Um, we run this along with the Sustainable Fleet Technology Conference, and I do want to thank everybody that that came and uh, participated to help make uh, our 2023 show in Raleigh a success. I, we had some great feedback and we're gonna do it again next year uh, at the Raleigh Convention Center again. Uh, date to TBD, we're tied up in our usual state and federal bureaucracy to be able to, to nail it down, but that's gonna happen hopefully in the next 30 days. But um, these webinars, uh, past webinars, uh, presentations, and as well as the stuff all tied to the conferences for the last couple of years is all housed at sustainablefleetexpo.com. So there's, there's a lot out there, the recordings, the presentations, and the webinars going back three years, as well as the same for the conference. Um, agenda today, you know, I'm Rick Sapiens. I'm going to do the welcome. And I was also a judge for the Green Fleet Award winners. This was my fourth year being a judge. I'll uh, give a few of my comments and perspective on it. Uh, Joe Clark from City of Durham is going to uh, talk about what they're doing, and you know, one of his messages is, you know, the little things add up, chipping away to achieve your sustainability goals. I said Scott Bradley's going to talk. Then we have Scott Stevens and uh, Yomel Zakaria, from Miami Dade. Um, you know, looking at Flo everybody saying Florida is going to be underwater, so they're doing their part to, you know, keep my beach beachfront place not underwater. And then Scott Chandler, who uh, is City of Phoenix. They were the number one fleet this year, Green Fleet, and um, looking at a diversified measured approach to greening your fleet. And then we'll go to Q&A. So that's that. Here's my contact information. I am available anytime I can try and help you. Reach on out and I'll, I'll do my guess best. If I can, I'll get you in touch with somebody who can give you some answers and help you from there. Um, here's today's speakers. Like I said, Joe Clark, uh, City of Durham. Joe serves as the Fleet Management Director for the City of Durham. Um, North Carolina. Uh, he has over 38 years of experience in fleet management uh, and a proven tra track record of success. Under his leadership, the city of Durham has consistently received recognition from NAFA 
and 100 Best Fleets, the Green Fleet Awards, uh, Government Fleet Magazine is a leading fleet. And Joe is a dedicated uh, to public service and strives to provide the best possible value to the city of Durham. He's been a good partner with uh, my organization here and has helped us out uh, with equipment and, you know, as he's doing today, as he's done in the past, you know, his knowledge and expertise. Uh, Scott Bradley uh, is an EV advocate with hands-on experience driving some of the most advanced and innovative EV models on the market. He's pretty much driven everything out there uh, from the small stuff up to the class eights. Uh, in addition, he's an EV charging and charging EV charging and EV charging infrastructure expert, has a passion for the industry history as well as a passion for driving the industry forward. Consummate road, road warrior. If you attend any of the industry shows, you're likely to run into Scott. Uh, when I get on the phone with him, it's like, where are you now this week? Or, hey, I'm going here, Scott. Are you going to be there? And the answer is always yes. Um, then our, our dynamic duo from Miami-Dade, uh, Scott Stevens, uh, Fuel and Support Systems Manager for the Internal Services Department's Fleet Management Division. Um, I guess a fun fact about Scott, he enjoys low and slow backyard barbecue cooking with a good cigar. And then we got uh, Yomel Zakaria. He's the division director uh, over the Internal Services Service Department's Fleet Management Division. Um, fun fact on Yomel, he's an avid bow hunter, enjoys saltwater fishing. And him and I have exchanged some fish stories uh, at the last few um, conferences. And then Scott Channel, like I said, uh, City of Phoenix. He's the current Fleet Operations Manor, Manager um, for the City of Phoenix's, Phoenix's public works team. Um, he is a fuel guy. He's worked in uh, the in fuel in the fuels career field for 35 years, starting at a full service fuel station in 1984. He spent 24 years in the U.S. Air Force as a fuel specialist. Also, also spent time in the natural gas industry and with Arizona DOT. So there's our, our lineup for today. And we're going to go ahead and, and get going. I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the contest. So the mission of the contest, oh, um, it's a spinoff of the 100 Best Fleets founded by Tom Johnson, who unfortunately we lost um, late last year. Tom was just an invaluable resource to the industry. He brought folks together, helped exchange ideas, really you know, moved some things along, uh, helped accelerate some of the some of the things that are going on here right now in this transition on transportation. But the conference is, is itself is to recognize the outstanding efforts and results and sustainability of fleets across the country. But even more important, and I think, and I think Tom and even the folks out there will agree, it's, it's to share best practices, bring together our community and the professionals in the industry to increase knowledge, drive adoption of technology, and be environmental stewards, you know, and, and do our part in the fleet sector. So that's 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 kind of what we're all about here. And then, um, you know, in the applications this year, it was a little bit different format. We had a new question. What are the impediments and challenges? And resoundingly, we heard over and over again, funding and financing, vehicle availability, and then resistance to change, you know, moving your organization, getting training, gaining buy-in, you know, that procurement is just a major challenge is, you know, not enough vehicles available, orders getting pushed out or canceled. Um, you know, this, the green effort doesn't come free. Long term, you save money, but up front is cost. How do you finance it? I mean, those are struggles. And then even tied to that, we heard the an undercurrent tied to electrification. There's a huge push. I don't care who you are uh, in fleet. You're in one of three phases. You are thinking about it, trying to figure out how to do it. You've dipped your toe in the water and you're, you've run some pilots and you're moving forward. Or you're beyond that and you are moving forward. Right? Every single fleet I talk to, public and private, electrification is on their radar. So the struggles, I mean, I, I think everybody could tell them, tell them what they are. You know, lack of vehicle options, you know, vehicles to do the job, especially in the medium and, and heavy duty. If they're coming they're out. However, they're costly. They cost them. They cost, you know, two to three times in some case, um, both, you know, and then the infrastructure itself. And then, you know, you need to plan for today, but also plan for the future. And the biggest thing with any alternative fuel is access to the fuel. So as you grow your fleet, you need to be able to meet your charging needs. 
So those those were you know our big takeaways in, in terms of challenges that we're facing out there. So some other observations of you know what folks are doing. Um, really strong use of hybrids. More, I've seen it more and more over the last couple of years. And you know if you look at a hybrid, there's some benefits there. It is an idle reduction technology. I mean, if that vehicle's not moving, it shuts down. And we're seeing uh, public safety who spends an inordinate amount of time idling, um, embracing hybrid vehicles, and they're saving quite a bit of, of you know, money on fuel, um, PMs, et cetera. Um, the use of alternative renewable fuels, uh, really good to see. Uh, biodiesel is very strong, renewable where you can get it, and even uh, renewable natural gas. It's really come on. Its usage in the um, transportation sector has more than doubled in the last three years. Um, out on the West Coast, 90% of transportation natural gas is biogas. And the rest of the country is lagging a little bit, but we're, we're at about 55%, 50-55% um, on that. Um, the creativity, and you know, we face challenges. And, you know, in fleet, we don't have the choice of, of saying, no, we got to fix it and keep the fleets up and running to, to provide services. And, you know, how do you do it? You know, one, one we had an example was one of our top fleets, Denver. They're trying to do some electrification and they had some budget challenges. Well, they did a fleet right sizing exercise. And with the money they saved, they were able to get their charging in for their 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 um, their new charging projects. Um, learning from others. I mean, we all help each other. That's what part of this is. That's what, you know, all the industry uh, conferences and, and sessions, flag is going on right now. I learn from others. And it's, you know, it, it's a group that's willing to help you. Um, not a business as usual with attitude, embracing change, embracing technology. Uh, there is a methodology to becoming a top fleet. This doesn't happen by accident. You know, you need support from above um, and, and from across your organization. You need the training, you need the budgets, you need to set goals, you need to have plans, but you also need policies and procedures. That's part of the application and the folks that do these things across the board, those are the folks that score high. Um, employee involvement and development, developing your people from within, um, involvement, having them contribute, having them have ownership and driving, you know, a team and enthusiasm. And then, you know, using all the tools in the toolbox. Um, you know, great craftsman uses all his tools. He doesn't use just a hammer. And when we, we look at diversity of your fuel use, diversity of technologies, and, you know, the folks here today did a very good job at that. That's why they're here. So those are the things we saw, we see and we, we look for. And that's it for me in terms of my comments and observations. Wanna go ahead, Joe? Thank you, Rick. I'd like to start out by thanking NAFA and the supporters uh, for sponsoring the, the Green Free program, as well as you know allowing me to share some of the good things we're doing here in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, next slide. There you go. Like many of us, uh, we've got some carbon neutrality goals. Some of them are mandated by the state, federal, or even local governments. Uh, we've got some pretty aggressive goals here in Durham. We want to be 100% uh, renewable energy by 2050, 80% renewable energy by 2030, and carbon neutral by city operations by 2040. Uh, so a lot of that has to do with buildings. So I guess the next question is, you know, what does that have to do with fleet? So next slide. So with that, we've got some strategic initiatives that we're going to undertake. And, you know, if we do this correctly, we should hit all the milestones. So one of the things we're going to do is look at light duty, which happens to be the area right now where you can find some EVs. So the model we're, we're adopting assumes a 50% conversion by 2030 and 100% conversion to EV by 2040 in the light duty sector. Light duty pickup trucks, same thing. We're moving away from gasoline. Uh, the adoption rate is slightly slower. We're gonna assume a 33% conversion by 2030 and 100% by 2040. But strangely enough, we've got more light duty pickup trucks and vans that are EVs and we do cars because they're just easier to get a hold of right now. On the medium duty and heavy duty, 
you know, that, that technology is kind of slow to roll in. We're going to take a slow approach on that because we're real big on if we're going to spend the money, we want to make sure that it's capable of the duty cycle that we're used to. So with this model, we're looking at a 20% conversion by 2040, but you know, by then there may be uh, different options available. You know, I'm a big fan of hydrogen, although hydrogen's not available where we reside, but I think it's a fuel that's gonna be great for some locations. Next slide. So one of our approaches right now, and Rick kind of alluded to this, we're we're all in on hybrids. So in most cases, most cities, the, your public your uh, public safety folks drive the most miles, burn the most gasoline. So with not a real proven electric vehicle out there yet, we're going all in on hybrids. So virtually every vehicle we buy for the police department, whether it's a detective car, an administrative car, or a frontline police car is, is most likely gonna be a hybrid. We continue to look at uh, best practices as far as, uh, can you go back to the slide, Rick? You know, we continue to do utilization studies. You know, we've got a limited amount of money, so we're not gonna replace vehicles that don't hit our utilization, utilization threshold of 6,000 miles a year on average. And, you know, when we do buy vehicles, some of the times we will move these vehicles around. So somebody that puts a lot of miles on a car, they'll get the new car and we'll move that low mileage car to another department that really probably can't justify ownership of a new vehicle. And with all that in mind, this year we are on track to increase our EV fleet by 88%. All right, next slide. So with that said, we are piloting EVs in our public safety department. So we've got a Mustang there for the fire department and we've got multiple Mustang Mach-E's in the police department. As a matter of fact, we're getting four more today. Uh, so far, these have been up to the task. Don't see a reason why they won't work. It's, it's really more of adopting you know, embracing the difference, you know, getting the chargers in place and understanding that it's not a gasoline vehicle and it's going to have to be juiced up in a different way. But other than that, it, it seems fully capable of doing the job. All right, next slide. Uh, Rick kind of alluded to this earlier. We're big on biofuels. So we uh, burn a lot of uh, biodiesel. For those that are afraid of it, uh, or you hear the horror stories, you know, in the South, it's going to work better than it does up in the areas where it's cold. Your first experience, you're going to really need to stay on top of it. Uh, it's kind of a solvent. It's going to clean your tank, and it's going to get some stuff into your uh, filters that you're not used to seeing. But if you aggressively PM your uh, fuel pumps, and then your vehicles, we found that we haven't had any fuel filters clog up once we kind of knew what to look for. So at the fuel pump itself, you know, we've got them on a, a tight PM schedule and then on the vehicles as well. And we're not seeing any, any bad things happen by running, you know, biodiesel. We also have plans to use a B100 and some select applications going forward. And these are simple ways to kind of get on Greenfleet's radar to help you earn some points in this contest. Uh, next slide. And then getting back to our theme, a lot of little things add up. I mean, we, we do a lot of different things. If you haven't used any of the Goodyear soy tires, I would recommend that you look into that. I mean, that's a uh, Kind of a renewable product. We're having good, good use out of those tires. We've got solar charging stations. We've got uh, battery powered APUs on our fire apparatus, battery powered smart PTOs on our bucket trucks. We do some idle reduction. And we use a lot of software to optimize, you know, the torque curve on some vehicles. And of course, telematics and 
routing software helps you get the best you know out, out of the vehicle so you're not driving all over town we've got some really smart routes set up you're going to save gas doing that next slide and like all of us these these vehicles are new to us they're here to stay or they're here for the time being so it's, it's important to learn how to work on them right now it's kind of take it to the dealer see what they have to say but we, we we're starting to train everybody and by the end of the year, we hope to have everybody, at least with the first ASC XEV level one. And so far, we're not seeing a lot of problems with the EV. So it's it's really more of how to be safe when you're opening the hood and working on these vehicles, because there's really not a lot of stuff that's breaking, you know, knock on wood right now. Next slide. And that's all I've got. So, you know. Happy to answer any questions. No, great. Thanks, Joe. I mean, you guys are doing a good job out there. And, you know, I like the all of the above approach. You're 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 looking at any way you can do it and any technology that they can help you. Okay, next we got um, Scott Bradley. He's gonna talk about um, uh, off grid charging solution that his company has. Great. Thank you, Rick. Uh, thank you for having us today. Um, yeah, so we work with a lot of fleets out there, and you know the good news is vehicles are starting to arrive for the fleets. Electric vehicles are arriving for the fleets. Uh, the question is, is your fleet ready for it? Uh, next slide. We see a number of uh, challenges that are that are faced kind of across the board. Uh, one is delay in infrastructure. So I, I get calls on. Uh, on a weekly basis from fleets saying, look, we've our, our vehicles are going to arrive, our electric vehicles are arriving in three months, but you know, it's, it's going to take a year for the transformer to arrive, or the switch gear is, going to, is you know, a year and a half out, or we need to actually do a service upgrade, which could be two to three years. So there's a, a, a long period of time, anywhere from a, a year to three years sometimes, um, waiting for some of the fleets to get infrastructure in certain locations. Um, so one, one piece they're looking for is, is temporary infrastructure to be able to charge the vehicles until the permanent infrastructure is in place. Um, the other call I get is from fleets that are on leased land. And you know, the owner of the land won't allow them to do the trenching to put in permanent infrastructure. So how do they charge? Because they're, they're often leasing their vehicles, um, leasing the land, how do they run electric vehicles? So these are two of the challenges that are, are faced. Uh, go to the next slide, please. And also locations that are just very rural um, or underserved communities that don't have sufficient power. When we, we think about the uh, alternative fuel corridor is a good example where they're requiring power every 50 miles. Um, there are a lot of locations that just don't have sufficient power. Um, and again, how, how do you get your your fleet's charged if they're in these very rural locations without 480 or underserved communities. Uh, next slide. So with uh, with challenges come opportunities. And what I really want to talk about here is some off-grid electric vehicle charging uh, solutions. And really, it's, it's the power before the power. Right? How, how do you charge these vehicles for that year to three years until the permanent infrastructure is in place? Uh, next slide. So if we go underneath the hood here, um, what we look at is, and think of these as building blocks and units because all units vary just as fleets vary. Uh, but this is a unit that's used by last mile delivery vehicles. Um, click forward. Um, and in this case, with the last mile delivery fleet, their concern is they need to charge, in this case, six vehicles overnight. So in that case, they can use the six level two chargers, but they've found that a couple of their routes are longer than the vehicle will actually handle. The, the, the battery they found out isn't sufficient for the whole day of with just one day of charging. So they'll come back midday for opportunity charging. Uh, we see this also with school bus fleets. Again, well, they'll charge overnight with the buses, but again, come back midday for a couple of the routes that are extra long. Um, so when we talk about off-grid, so we match the amount of power in the chargers 
with a propane generator, right? We use propane because it's a renewal, it's a clean fuel. There's also renewable propane available, which is extremely clean. Um, and we have, again, some number of propane tanks. Um, next slide. Now, because we're off grid, um, what we do is monitor things in real time. So we're monitoring the chargers for up-down status, monitoring the generators to see when they need servicing, monitoring the propane and automatically pinging the local provider if it gets low. So from a user perspective, it stays constant. They can just run their charging as they normally would. Now, a lot of groups also use this for early stages of their fleets to do fleet planning, uh, to understand, did they get the right vehicles for the routes? Or did they get the right amount of charging for those vehicles that they got? Um, and then on top of here also, we have a uh, some solar panels for the parasitic loads because chargers are always drawing power even when they're quote off and an LTE mesh just to be able to communicate. So we do a lot of proactive monitoring as well. Uh, next slide. So uh, a lot of people ask, you know, what kind of solutions are out there, right? And people are looking at doing off-grid charging primarily in three ways, with hydrogen, with battery, and with propane or natural gas. Um, we actually started out looking at hydrogen first. It's a very clean fuel, uh, very low carbon intensity, but it's, it's very difficult to transport uh, and not readily available, right? There are not many locations where you can get a hydrogen uh, powered station. Um, we looked at battery too. Um, battery of course is still expensive, um, but it is easy to transport. The challenge we found with batteries is that it's really not off grid, right? The reality is if you have a large battery charging the smaller batteries in your vehicles, eventually you have to take that big battery, bring it somewhere else, charge it and swap it out with another battery. So not really easy, which really what led us to propane. Uh, again, low cost, easy to transport, readily available. And propane is actually cleaner than the grid in 38 states here in the US. And renewable propane is cleaner than the grid in 49 states. So again, really clean out there. Uh, next slide. Um, and then also due to uh, some requests in Hollywood, we're actually mixing some battery and propane solutions going forward. Next slide. So I just want to wrap up with two slides here, just showing different kinds of vehicles that exist out there for off-grid charging, everything from what you see in the upper left-hand corner, where International is providing this to their dealers, to the upper right, where it's charging Mac refuse trucks. Um, Merchants Fleet is a company that provides, they're committed to 40,000 EVs and are moving, uh, not only leasing vehicles, but also leasing uh, infrastructure. Uh, and then in the lower right, you see what we call the generator on a truck, which is a, a truly mobile kind of AAA type of model. Next slide. And that is uh, it for me. Thank you, Rick. Great, Scott. Thank you. We appreciate you enlightening us here on, on your product and, and some of the challenges and benefits. Thank you. Okay, now we have Miami Dade. They're going to talk about how they're approaching sustainability and doing their part to stave off um, you know, climate change. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we'll be speaking today and to share our best practices, but in specific one best practice that uh, we think is very important, which is policy and then the enforcement of that policy uh, driven from uh, executive management. Uh, we are Miami-Dade County and here's a comprehensive approach to facing climate change. Next slide, please. So, you know, who are we? Uh, Miami-Dade County is the eighth largest uh, county in the United States by population. Uh, we're made up of 32 departments and we employ, employ more than 27,000 personnel. Um, our fleet is made up of 14,000 or over pieces of equipment uh, and vehicles. And uh, for the county, the, and, you know, the transportation makes about 55% of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, actually, let me circle back really quick. Uh, my name is Jamal Cicada. We mentioned that earlier. Um, and to my left is Scott Stevens. Next slide, please. 
Uh, so for us, uh, taking on climate change down here in South Florida, Rick uh, kind of um, prefaced it that we're dealing with sea level rise, sea level temperature rise, all these things. Um, and all that's causing extreme heat conditions. Uh, we're dealing with flooding, hurricanes, the whole nine down here in South Florida. And uh, the big thing is sea level rise. Um, but so taking on climate change for us it requires a comprehensive approach. And uh, we were, we were lucky enough or blessed enough, or I don't know how you want to say it, but uh, to where leadership sees this too. Um, and we've actually been able to start rethinking um, how we design and redesign and forward think on our infrastructure from buildings, transportation, roads, bridges, everything in between, a storm drain um, cleanup, storm drain management. Uh, but the main thing was is, is to take on climate change, we have to address our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so I'm not going to read the slide, you guys can read it, but it, it's mainly just to address it in a way that can improve everybody's quality of life uh, uh, across the board all throughout our county. Next slide, please. All right. I'll take this one. Right. Um, for us, leadership set the tone. Um, our, our mayor, our, our newly, uh, she's not newly elected, but I mean, she's first term mayor. Uh, Danielle, uh, Daniela Levine Cava, she's very passionate about the environment. Um, and and when she took she took into office, she she made it a top priority, a very top priority to start tackling the climate change, especially here in Miami Dade County, where we're so we are so vulnerable. So she spearheaded a, a new strategy um, to where she took. Uh, it's called the Climate Action Strategy. And what what we did was uh, take all the nonprofit organizations, all the business organizations, plus county organizations that have to deal with the environment. And she put them all, put us all in rooms, virtual rooms because of COVID and everything else that was going on. And we had these meetings that went over a year long talking about the things that matter to climate change. And from that, we built up a comprehensive approach. Next slide, please. And then the climate action strategy uh, that was actually developed um, that has different uh, key components, uh, the main being energy and buildings, land use and transportation, and water and waste. <clears throat> energy and buildings and uh, land use and transportation is really where uh, fleet has a piece of this pie, right? because we have the vehicles and then the vehicles uh, such as EVs will need infrastructure, which comes from the facilities. Um, and the reason why we're talking to you today from a policy perspective is because once you have the administrative uh, executives or mayor or you know the politicians uh, supporting you, it drives the rest of your process to be that much smoother and easier. Um, a climate action strategy uh, that was developed that is a mandate basically to all the departments and a commitment uh, and it, you know, it's for it to clear, have clearly defined goals and achieve 80% of the community wide emissions reduced by 2050. Um, you know, reduce gas and diesel fuel consumption by 30 and 70% respectively, uh, reduce electricity usage, uh, implement sustainable buildings program and have 30% of countywide energy obtained from solar by 2030. Um, so that policy really drives the rest of the, the directives and vehicle purchasing and green initiatives that come from a fleet perspective. Next slide, please. As such, we had clearly defined goals, right? And, and the, uh, the climate action strategy drove the action, pun intended, from Scott Drive, um, which it's to address the greenhouse gas emissions, you know, from a fleet perspective, right? That means that we had policies that were passed for the light fleet electrification for it to be 100% EV by the year 2030, right? And all of these items uh, that were passed, they took, you know, the various discussions with administrative uh, executive level positions and you know, to, to the politicians level at the mayors. Um, we also developed a minimum miles per gallon requirement for ICE vehicles that were going to be purchased 
So at the very top, you'll see that is our EV uh, purchase plan. To the right, you'll see a table. And we had to provide a plan by fiscal year. That is the plan by fiscal year. You'll see 21, 22, and 22, 23 is in gray because those are already taking place or have already taken place. And as of currently, we're up to 146 uh, electric vehicles. We actually have a few more that just came in. So we're like around the 150 mark. But I think they, we're 152. 152, yeah. So, But they haven't necessarily been uh, uh, accepted and put into put in use yet. So not in active status yet. Um, you want to talk about the fuel reduction? Sure. On the fuel reduction side, um, uh, we've actually finally started to see, uh, I'm the fuel manager, so this is my baby. Uh, we've actually uh, reached our goal for the diesel. We had a goal of reducing our diesel um, output or consumption by 70% by 2028. But as of last month, we've hit our 70% goal already. Uh, that's in large part thanks to our transit and public work section uh, where they converted their diesel bus fleet to compressed natural gas and They've just uh, implemented uh, electric buses as well. Um, so we're, 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 we've crushed the diesel uh, reduction emissions. Um, and we're going to far exceed that 70% goal. But for the gasoline, it's the opposite story. Uh, we've noticed an increase in gasoline over the last few years until this year with the implementation of some best practices and with the uh, EV fleet. Uh, introduction, we're starting to see a decrease in gasoline consumption for the first time since 2016, um, which is a, a very good sign. We've uh, actually had a 14% decrease from last year to this year. Um, so we're very proud of that. We expect that to, to even grow more as more electric vehicles come into the um, market and coming to the, the, the streets, hit the streets here in South Dade. Yeah, and as we started implementing uh, fuel savings initiatives, the fleet also grew uh, because, you know, the county is growing, Florida grew as a whole. So it took us a few years for that Delta yeah. to start turning around and the fuel green initiatives to start uh, outweighing the size of the growth. Yep. Um, so, uh, yeah. And I mean, I know what we're speaking about today is the policies and how it drives. That's more or less the high level, but it's really to relay the importance as a best practice to have your executives, your politicians, um, you know, and uh, elected officials at those levels. If you are able to uh, to capture their attention, then they are able to provide you the support and make the rest of the processes much more uh, efficient, cleaner faster, you know, with funding available, et cetera. Obviously for the fuel reduction, that took many discussions with different departments, going over uh, what strategies can be used to reduce fuel here and there versus, uh, you know, um, for example, uh, having smart route, uh, the solid waste department where you could cut out the, the amount of routes that the vehicles have to be driven, but that's more at the, uh, the weeds of things. The purpose of our best practice that we want to talk to you about is that you know policy at the high level and how that can be leveraged to really streamline um, the rest of the work that has to be done by the fleet by the fleet folks you know pretty much everyone here in this yeah this one if i can just add real quick this would be the last thing um yeah the the climate action strategy from the mayor's office it wasn't just uh political speak if you will to get you know a feather in the cap for the next thing it was an actionable thing for, for her and her office and her administration to where we have seen throughout the county um, progress from every department on every level pushing uh, to be greener, to be more green on their buildings, to be more green with their fleet, to be more green with how they think and plan uh, for the future. Um, we just had a meeting before this one where we were talking about a program that was a direct um, uh, a direct contribution from her mandates that, that are pushing a couple of different departments to really be aggressive with their infrastructure planning for electrification of their fleet. Um, it's it's really driven, literally driven um, our, our policies to become actionable and very quickly. All these numbers that you see here are in the last 18 months. So as a best practice to close it out, we recommend that you lobby for the support of your elected officials and those executive level positions because that'll help you uh, get to where you'd like to be. Next slide. Thank you all.
You're muted, Rick. I went and muted myself. Uh, thanks, guys. But uh, good point. That's one of the biggest things in change management is you need the support from above. You need to have the tools to to carry out these directives. And then the other thing is, you know, you can pay lip service, but you need to drive action. You got to mean what you say, do what you do what you say. And um, and good point. So thank you guys. And I want to let Scott Chandler, uh, City of Phoenix, Arizona, the number one green fleet for this year. Give us their secret sauce. Scott? All right. Well, thank you, Rick. And um, you can move to the next slide, please. Yeah. First of all, I'd just like to thank NAFA and the judges who took the time to read all the applications. It's a great honor for the City of Phoenix to be selected as the 2023 number one Green Fleet. So thank you for that. To win these type of awards, you need buy-in from all levels, and we do at the city. And like any great sports team or any any team that you're on, you need a good um, game plan or roadmap, and that's how we use our the city's climate action plan. And that plan has uh, fleet goals that we strive to achieve. One of our main goals is the city of Phoenix is committed to green fleet technologies related to alternative fuels and new fuel technology with a focus on transitioning from internal combustion engines to low carbon alternative fuels and electric vehicles. So really what we look to do first is we look to buy any alternative fuels when we're replacing our vehicles. Next slide. Our team also works with partners within the city. We work with the Office of Environmental Programs and the Office of Sustainability to keep departments updated on green uh, fleet initiatives and we also work together to educate, advise, and monitor the city's use of products and services and their impact on the environment. We also have tips on saving fuel, um, check tire pressure, and um, anti-idling regulations. We also have a policy that promotes purchasing products that have a reduced effect on the human health and the environment. So as you can see, the city is committed to reducing our carbon footprint and going green. Next slide. Now a little bit about our fleet. The fleet department supports 7,800 vehicles, and we have a mixture of sedans, pickup trucks, solid waste vehicles, fire department, police department, and heavy duty vehicles. And we have more than 14,000 customers, 18 shops, and 85 fuel facilities. So you can see we have a very large fleet. The city's alternative fuel program, we consume over eight, or sorry, 10 million gallons of fuel annually. And 73% of the fuel that we consume is considered an alternative fuel, so a very high percentage. We have two motor pools, and one thing that we recently added to our motor pool is our customers can reserve the right to check out an EV vehicle. So I think that's going to go a long way, so we're just promoting the EV and the green initiatives even further. We do use GPS in our solid waste vehicles. And what we try to do with that is we're optimizing our routes based on miles, time, and number of containers. And this is just to ensure that we have the most effective routes to save on fuel and our resources. Next slide. And with this slide, this is kind of where our meat and potatoes comes into. So as a person who manages our, our fuel sites, if I only had two fuels, which would be a lead and a diesel, that would be easy. I wouldn't have any problems coming to work every day. I wouldn't have all the headaches. But you know that's not the right thing to do for the environment or for the future. So what we do is we explore, we research, and and we look for different ways to, you know, see what's out there in the industry and, and and what's the the newest and latest alternative fuel that we can offer to our customers. And some of the ways that we do that we build networks, whether it be working with the city of Clean Cities Coalition, we attend webinars similar to this. And even the city of Phoenix, we have an energy broker that always keeps us up to date on the latest and greatest type things. And I'll go into more with the energy broker in just a minute. One unique thing we do with the city of Phoenix, I don't think a lot of other places are doing, is we actually purchase, we ship, we store, and we deliver all of our fuel. So when we're looking at our alternative fuels below, I'll, I'll talk about some of the successes and some of the challenges that we have. So our biodiesel, kind of like Joe said earlier, we don't really have a lot of problems with our biodiesel. 
It's primarily used for our fire department vehicles and our heavy equipment. And if you're not familiar with biodiesel, it's, it's basically 80% diesel fuel, 20% biodiesel. And, you know, I, as you probably heard from my bio, I've been in fuels a long time and it must have been 15, 20 years ago when biodiesel first came on the market. There was some people said things like, hey, this is just kind of like McDonald's cooking grease and other restaurants grease. It was kind of strained to a filter and they mix it with diesel fuel. And, and they had some problems back in the day. Well, I think a lot of that has been corrected. A lot of it's not necessarily McDonald's cooking grease. It's coming from the byproducts of soybean oils. So they really improved the technology and a lot of things you heard in the past or the, the, the bad things about biodiesel, most of it has gone away. But even with that being said, if you're storing that fuel for six months, like in generator tanks or things of that nature, there could be some microbial growth though. So I would say there's a small possibility that you could have some challenges, but by and large, we use biodiesel in well over 95% of all of our vehicles that we issue that require diesel fuel. So it's been a real successful program, the biodiesel. Moving on to flex fuel. We typically use this for our police vehicles, usually our Tahoes. Again, really not, not much problem with the E54. We, we used to be E55, and that was a little bit hard on sometimes the older fuel tanks and some of the equipment, meaning the um, ethanol kind of did some damage sometimes. So we reduced the percentage to 54% ethanol, 46% unleaded fuel. And ever since we did that, we really haven't had any issues. Some of the challenges that we do have with E54 fuel or flex fuel is that it seems like the vehicles are getting harder to buy or purchase. So we, we've had a little bit of problem with that. So we just, uh, the reduced number of vehicles that are using it is really the only issue with uh, flex fuel. And then let's talk about compressed natural gas. I kind of have a little bit of a love-hate relationship with CNG, meaning I love it because we, we actually have the opportunity working with our energy brokers that we can hedge our compressed natural gas up to five years in advance. And the reason why we do that is because we're not buying it as you would, like if you're, you're, you're buying it for your house, it's whatever the gas company is going to charge you. We can actually look and forecast, hey, when is it a good time to purchase extra compressed natural gas? And we buy layers of it. And what I mean by layers, we may buy a percentage of that up to 80% of our expected usage. And the reason we do that, like I said, we work with our energy broker is to save the overall price per gallon for our customers. So I love to be able to tell our solid waste team at the end of the year that, hey, we saved you you know, a couple million dollars because we were able to use compressed natural gas and we also hedged it to get you the best price possible. A little bit a bit more about our compressed natural gas. It's, it's intended to fill our solid waste fleet and they fill our solid waste fleet during the night, meaning that after they've ran their routes for the day, they park their trucks, trucks are filled during the night, they come in and they can run their route. Well, there's been times that they need to come back into the yard to fill and the reason for that is because the this is the part I don't like about compressed natural gas is you have smaller tanks and the range is reduced. So they have to come in sometimes and top off and go back out. Well, if you have a large number of vehicles that are continuing to come in and top off and go back out, the compressors just have a hard time keeping up sometimes. And what I mean by that is the, um, the PSI, the pressure that it takes to fill the vehicles and uh, the compressors really do not like the heat here in Phoenix. So in the summertime when these vehicles are coming back, they tend to uh, overheat, they go down, that causes problems with our customers. So that's the part that I do not like about compressed natural gas. And the, the other part is it costs a little bit more to maintain. And we have a dedicated contractor that comes out and maintains our systems. But again, when it's hot out and there's just sometimes nothing you can do with an overheated compressor. So I do like compressed natural gas, but it does have its challenges. But if it's managed correctly, you can have significant savings. And obviously, it's a clean burning fuel. So it's, it's really good. Um, we just introduced RNG. And I'm going to kind of finish with that during my presentation. So I'll get back to that. But we do have that in our arsenal. And then our uh, liquid natural gas, LNG, is primarily used for our transit buses. 
And it, it's a great product similar to CNG. In fact, that's what ha happens is it comes in on a truck on LNG. And then the only problem I, or challenges you have with LNG is you have to have a lot of infrastructure, meaning you have to have some large tanks, you have to have compressors, and then it fills the transit buses. So really the only challenge with LNG is that you have to make sure your supply chain is moving and keep going because uh, there's not a lot of storage with LNG, but it works very, very well. So we are also like everyone else, we're transitioning to electric vehicles. I'm gonna talk a little bit about more of that later, but we also do have some of the beams and we're kind of testing those out to see how they work. You know, it, the, the sales pitch on beam sounds great, but when you put it into practice, is it really, kind of delivering as expected. So we're testing a few of those to see how we're doing it. But what we're doing too with EVs is we're moving slowly. We're trying to do it because we want to make sure we do it right the first time. That's, that's kind of our main goal. And then lastly, our uh, friends over at Aviation, they just added a new leg onto the SkyTrain. And they used to run CNG buses over there. And now that they have this SkyTrain, they're actually able to reduce their amount of CNG buses they have and that obviously it not only reduces the buses, but it also re removes the or reduces the amount of traffic that flows through that area. This makes things a lot smoother. And obviously, the SkyTrain ran off uh, electricity, so we're again removing just one more vehicle off the road. So I think that's that's a win. So uh, next slide, please. And then I talk a little bit about what we do in our shops. Our staff gets trained on the very first day they start work and, and they're gonna recycle all fluids, metal, cardboard, all that typical stuff that most shops do. I would like to kind of highlight one really neat thing that we do in the city of Phoenix is that we have a lot of high value body parts that come in from vehicles that get into accidents, whether it be a bumper, um, some door panels, and even engines if they get hit in the rear. So we are removing those. We kind of store them in an area. And then if we ever have another vehicle that comes in and needs a new part or something, we can reuse those, those items. Not only saves costs, but it reduces kind of the things that we would send maybe to the landfill or to be recycled. So uh, we've also found a, that's been very good for to save costs. So and then lastly, we we uh, obviously any underutilized vehicles we look at every year and we move them from the fleet. Next slide. So here's some of our efficiencies and our sustainability or or green operations that we kind of like to brag about. And one of the things that we put in our um, not only for our fleet vehicles but our employee parking lot is we we put in solar covered parking. And this is great. It seems like the employees love it, especially in the summertime when you get in your vehicle. It probably reduces the inside temperature by about 20 degrees. <laughs> your air conditioning works on the way home. But the, the, the ultimate benefit is that we sell or we provide that electricity back to the energy company and they provide the electricity back to us at a discounted rate. So I think that's going to be a real benefit when we really start growing our EV fleet and we start using more and more electricity to charge our vehicles. So I think that's a real plus. We um, we, we buy uh, air conditioners that are the most energy efficient, so we're replacing those out. Uh, one thing I do want to talk about is our solid waste team, when they have diesel trucks, they're replacing them out with CNG. Now, right now, we're at about a 70-30 split between CNG, 70%, 30% diesel. And what I'm being told is the city will continue to change out the diesel to CNG. And that may be a challenge. And I wanted to kind of bring that up because kind of as a fuels guy or a, a good boy scout, I always like to have a backup plan. And like I said earlier, that sometimes when it gets hot and those compressors go down at your compressed natural gas stations, you, basically that, that system you can't use it until it cools down or sometimes you have to have maintenance on it so i would hate to ground a whole fleet because of the compressors or it's or it's too hot or they can't run now hopefully at night they cool down enough to, to be able to refuel but you hate to have any vehicle or any fleet that can't run so i would just say just be cautious of that i like to keep a 70 30 split between diesel and obviously the cng is used to reduce emissions and fuel costs and lastly, on this slide, the city presented at Fleet Focus. And this was an uh, opportunity to learn the best practice about fleet charging, the needs, planning, and strategies. And this was our really way to interact with the community to try to provide a, a positive spin on, you know, what are we doing and how can we can help them? Next slide. 
So as we look into the future, the th things that, that I'm looking at right now is B100 and hydrogen. I think those are two alternative fuels that we currently aren't looking at. I've done a little bit of research on B100, and I'll just provide a little bit of my knowledge on that. So we were looking to convert some of our B100, particularly solid waste trucks that are burning diesel. And I thought it was a really great idea. But the one thing that kind of stuck out to me is there was a high cost to convert one of our diesel trucks to run off B100. And not only that, the B100, it, the vehicle cannot start on straight B100, meaning that you still have to have either your diesel or biodiesel fuel tank start the vehicle, and then it kind of heats up the, the system to the B100, and then it can be converted over and the vehicle can be ran off that. Now, again, when you're thinking about it, it's a great idea because you're running off straight alternative fuel. You aren't even using any diesel. But as, as you, you probably know, those diesel engines need DEF. So now we're asking an operator to put B100 in his truck, diesel, and DEF, and make sure you have all those products. And you also have to have a separate B100 tank at those facilities. So there's a lot to go into B100. So we're not necessarily... Right now, we're kind of saying no, but we'll keep that option open. But I just want to kind of provide a little bit of knowledge on that. And of course, we're still waiting for the hydrogen infrastructure and things to build up on that to see how that direction goes. I'm kind of excited about hydrogen. I think that may be the, the future that we're kind of looking forward to. So we'll keep an eye on the hydrogen too. And, and, and any other alternative fuels that, that come on the market. That's one thing we do. We do a lot of research here in the city of Phoenix. And as I said earlier, I want to kind of circle back to our EV infrastructure and how we're growing it. Like I said, we want to do it right the first time and we want to move slow because we don't want to jump up into it and then find out we need to redo things or have some mistakes that, that we could have saw and corrected earlier. So we're using um, one of our contractors to identify locations and we're determining electri electrical requirements and how the best way to install the EV charging stations at the best price possible. And one thing that we're looking at that kind of opened our eyes is there's different costs involved depending on how much power you have or how much power you need to bring in, but it ultimately breaks down to how much does it cost per parking spot. So we found that, yeah, you can Put a few charging stations in one location, and but the price per parking spot could be kind of high, where if you continue to build that out, it kind of reduces the prices because you have some of the infrastructure already put in place. So again, we're just trying to figure out the best way to do it. And, and, and we're getting there and our consultants helping us. And even one step further, we hired an EV operations analyst. And his job is to help work with our contractors and to grow our EV fleet to figure out the best way to do it. And he does a lot, a lot of research. So the city is very, very serious into our EV infrastructure, buying, buying our vehicles and growing our EV fleet. So I'm excited to see how that's gonna develop over the next few years. Next slide. And really some of our outcomes, and, and I don't really need to say a lot about, that's our goal is we wanna reduce the petroleum fuels that we use. And I think we're doing that with a lot of our alternative fuels. And one of the outcomes that we have, because we, like I said earlier, we buy our own fuel, is that we can, um, if, if you're not familiar, the government provides the EPA renewable identification numbers. And they're usually, I, I, I call them like a coupon. It's an easy, easy way to think about it. And they're attached to biodiesel and ethanol. And they're almost sold like a stock on the stock market that the price comes up and down and every day and when you think you got a good price you could sell it and generate profits and as i'm sure a lot of you that have fuel tanks specifically underground fuel tanks you may not have a replacement fund to replace those older fuel tanks with newer tanks so for us in the city of phoenix this is a great avenue or a great venue for us i can actually generate profits and i can replace those older fuel tanks that are like i said underground before they create an environmental hazard if I can, I like to put them as above ground tanks, but sometimes the real estate doesn't allow that. But, you know, the new fuel tanks with double walls and some of the construction materials they use, you could almost say that they are they can last well into uh, more than 30 years, which is the current rate I usually like to replace them. 
So those renewable identification numbers really help us in, in that respect to uh, make sure that we're being good environmental stewards and not releasing any um, fluids into the ground. And the last slide, please. So I want to circle back again about our RNG, and I'll tell you a little story I had on that is that when I first was doing some research a couple of years ago on renewable natural gas, it, it came across at about $3 per gas gallon equivalent, and at the time I was paying about a dollar a gallon for CNG, so it really wasn't advantageous for the city to say, hey, we want to introduce RNG into our system at three times the price. But like I said, kind of like the B100 analogy, don't give up on things like that. You never know, things can change. So I just happened to be at an expo, a fuels expo, and I saw one of the booths at RNG. So I went over and talked to him and the guy was telling me, hey, if you use CNG, I can get you RNG and pay you for it. And, and initially my first thought was, well, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. So I took that information back and again, I went, back and work with my energy broker and I said, hey, is this is this true? Can you check it out, see what's going on? And, and he did check it out and he found out a couple of companies that we actually bid on, hey, can we provide RNG to the city? So we looked at the alternatives and we looked at the different price proposals and what we did is we teamed up with US Gain and sure enough, they were able to provide us fuel and pay us for it, believe it or not. So. Like I said, we're paying about a dollar a gallon for our CNG. This even brings it down even more. So if you look at the price and the environmental benefits, that they're pretty big. So um, we just started introducing RNG into our CNG pipeline. And in fact, after we finished, Tucson thought it was such a great idea, so they latched onto it. So sometimes you do things and it actually parlays into other areas. So yeah, we're claiming the RNG for us, but it's, it's growing and building. So I think it's a, a a cool story. And even on top of that is, is if you think about it, our solid waste team goes out and picks up trash around the city. They put it in the landfills. The landfill is actually the thing that's creating these gases and off methanes that they refine to make the RNG. So it's kind of a full circle type thing. So. And, and the cool thing about RNG is considered carbon neutral, even carbon negative, because of the products that can be captured with the greenhouse gases. And like I said, we're using the D3 RIN and we're able to save money and, and get a great price per gallon for our solid waste team. And I just think it's a great thing as we move toward a, a carbon neutral future. So, and uh, that's all I got, Rick. Oh, great. Thanks, Scott. Um, appreciate it. You know, good point with the RNG that, it, you know, on the um, pathway, it depending on your, your feedstock, it can be considered carbon neutral or carbon negative, um, which is which is a big deal. And um, I, I do want to reiterate your a statement that stood out in your applications is it's critical that we do it right the first time. We can't get can't afford to get it wrong. And, you know, that's what we tell you. Do your homework, do your research before you jump in. Because, you know, no matter what product you ever run, nothing runs perfect. There's unintended consequences. There are some shortfalls. You need to understand them going in so it doesn't become a showstop. And then, you know, comment you made just recently at the end of this, this presentation is the technology is dynamic. It is changing. We're seeing, you know, better iterations come out faster and faster. CNG isn't what it used to be, you know, 30, 40 years ago, uh, propane, et cetera. They're all become very reliable. They got ASTM standards for them. So the same thing with the biofuels, the biodiesel, and the, and the renewable. Um, so the reliability is there. The performance is there. Um, you know, all your fleets are examples of it. I mean, multiple technologies, multiple fuels. I really appreciate everybody's, everybody's time today. Looking at the Q&A, we're light. <laughs> But I'll encourage anybody, any questions or comments to our panelists, do it. We got one specifically for Scott Bradley. I got to specify the Scots because we got a few Scots in here. How does the eBoost solution compare to the Bloom Energy natural gas power plant? Are you familiar with the natural gas, the Bloom so, Energy? So that's a good question. Um, so there, there are a number of, of, of ways. So I guess... The, the, the first and foremost is as, as a uh, as a power plant, it's it's typically stationary, and we're a mobile solution, right? So just the markets we we target are different. Um, 
they use a fuel cell technology. Um, we use generators, again, more cost uh, effective. Um, typically, be, as, a, as a power plant, they're starting around five megawatts of, of power. Um, we typically go up to about 600 kilowatts of power and then start doing uh, multiple units. Um, also, we tend to have a, an integrated, again, because we're mobile, an integrated solution with the, the power and the, uh, the charging together. Uh, but very good question. Okay. Oh, we had another one come in. Okay, just a, just a comment. I, it's not really a question. Um, I think everybody can see it. Um, I guess any more, anybody in the audience, or I guess anybody in our, our on the panel want to, I don't know, reinforce or add something to what you folks said? If not, I didn't expect, usually these best practices are not, you know, a, a lively Q and A session. So I don't want to, I don't want to bore everybody. But anybody on the panel got anything further to add, or I want to add a, add a point or reinforce something. Um, Joe, there's a question on the soy tires. Um, did you buy them off the state contract? I know the price on the state contract is unbelievable. We bought them off of a co-op contract. I believe it was a U.S. Communities, but it's one of those things that we, uh, you know, wanted to try. It, it is a little more expensive, and uh, okay. we just wanted to test to see how it was working. Yeah, we just we just did a pilot with four organizations: uh, Wake Forest University, um, what was it, Charlotte. City of Cary and Morrisville, and they ran them. Feedback was good. What we're seeing in testing, um, they're a grippier tire in snow, ice, and rain. They have better um, longevity in terms of they, they don't wear as fast, so it's a, it's a longer tread wear life. Like I said, I it's I thought it was a great price on the on a state contract. If I could get the state contract price, I'd put it on every vehicle that I own. Um, uh, proven out there, they've been run, Michigan State Police have run them. Um, they've run them at Quantico. So the federal federal agencies have run them. Um, they started out with a, a pursuit tire, law enforcement, and they've expanded. They came out with a, a truck tire recently, and that it's a Goodyear product. So anybody that is interested in getting more information, you can contact me or I can get you in touch with the Goodyear folks. Yes, a few more came in. Here we go. Um, Maybe Scott on the West Coast, renewable diesel. Have you had any experience with that? No, I really haven't had any experience with renewable diesel. Yeah, I've heard what California is kind of doing with some of their things, but uh, we aren't using that. Just the B100 is what I was looking at. Right. So G Gary Lunch at, at, at Oregon, uh, what's it, Water and Light, he's been running it for probably six or seven years now, R99, exclusively in his fleet. And, you know, the reduction in carbon footprint because of the, the upstream carbon footprint is tremendous. Um, he has had no issues. It's got a higher cetane level, so you get more complete combustion. So anybody in stop and go and, and lower speeds doing manual regens, you'll see a reduction there. Um, it's got a much lower cloud point than biodiesel or even conventional diesel, and it's a straight drop in. The issue is the incentives on the West Coast, pretty much most of the capacity is going to the West Coast. It's been really hard. I know we've had folks in North Carolina trying to get buying groups. Um, Charlotte got one shipment um, that they used. Uh, Port Authority, New York, and New Jersey had it going for a while. I don't know if they're still getting it. The only one that I know is getting it on a consistent basis was Disney Orlando, and I'm still not sure they're even getting it. But more capacity is coming online. Um, we're actually going to have a session in October that will cover uh, bio and renewable diesel and renewable aviation fuel. Yeah, that's a good point, Rick. I, I did look at, there was a few few fuels that I did find and I was looking for if they were able to ship to here in Phoenix and I found that they were only available in California. So I, I think you're right is um, if, 
I think if they're successful and they work well, that they may start expanding that to allow for other customers like myself. Right. And then um, in terms of charging, and uh, you guys, the, the, talk, the question is, any any cities looking to create a leverage public shared charging infrastructure, medium and heavy duty vehicles? Um, any any comment there? I know there's this, you know, charging as a service, there's public private stuff, there's Zeme that's out there doing it in California. Um, there's another company that does, they're doing class eights. They're giving you the whole package of the vehicles and the charging. Um, so there's some creativity out there and it's, it's needed. The amount of charging we need and the amount of money that's going to take, um, everybody's going to jump in and help. But I'll let the, the folks on the panel, anybody looking at your medium heavy duty and, and how you how you tackle that one. We're just all waiting for Mr. Fusion. Mm -hmm. In case somebody does or doesn't get that, that's back to the future. Hey Rick, I'll just say as far as charging goes, we are real apprehensive to do any public charging because we want dedicated behind the fence charging for our vehicles so we know they'll be up and running, ready to go in the morning. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're kind of leery of anything medium and heavy duty right now that would be electric. Right. They're, they're working on them. They're coming. They've been running pilots. And if you go to the shows, you're starting to see, in fact, the um, Scott was out there, surprise, surprise, at GTSE with the, uh, the Freightliner fuel cell vehicle. Yeah. Class eight. That was the second show that it's been, it's been at. All right, I think how are we on time here? We're yeah, guys, we did a great job. We're we're within time, and I think we're we're kind of it for a little spattering of questions. I'd like to thank everybody, our audience, uh, for hanging in there, and and our our panelists for today and our top green fleets. Congratulations, guys! Keep up the good work, and I'd like to congratulate all the fleets in the in our top fifty green fleets for this year. Some really good work going out there. And I mean, that's that's part of the reward of the arduous task of going through all those applications. It takes quite a quite a bit of time. And um, I scratch my head and get a little dizzy sometimes, but it's 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 worth it to see all the good work that's going on out there. So thank you all. I'm gonna I'm gonna end it with that and have a good day. Thank you, Rick. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Rick. Oh, take care. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>